Welcome to day 13 of the Sociology Guys 2022 challenge. In this challenge, what I do is I set 20 marks of questions on the topic area each day, and then I attempt to answer those questions um, and post the answers to my website, thesociologyguy.com, or I put them in a video just like this one. This week, we've been looking at culture and identity. Two questions I said this morning were outline and explain two ways subcultures are shaped by an individual social class. So there are a number of different things we can look at there, how um, individuals come to form different subcultures. So, for example, working class subcultures, middle class subcultures, professional subcultures, upper class subcultures. Our second question uh, looks is an item question. For the item question, of course, you have to apply two hooks from the item. You have to apply two um, phrases from the item. You have to develop that response to answer the question. The question was analyze two explanations for the formation of identity. And in the item, we've got different sociological perspectives argue over how identity is formed. While some suggest that structural factors shape our identity, others argue that identity is socially constructed based upon our understanding of society. So there's a little bit of a hint at interactionism. There's also hints there at sort of like some of the conflict theories or some of the consensus theories, and um, the idea that structural factors shape our identity, social class, gender, ethnicity. Okay, so look, uh, through the day, what I do is I send out sort of like some information to sort of for people to see, to see sort of like some of the possible responses. Today, I sent out some stuff on so different social class subcultures. A lot of this is taken from Ken Brown's um, Sociology for AQA Volume 1. Um, and he's described um, the different kind of um, subcultures in there really well. So what I've done is I've kind of summarized those and put them onto the sheet with a few pictures. So a number of different subcultures that you could have looked at for this question, traditional upper class, um, subcultures of new money, people who are self-made, business, um, you know, businessmen, sports, people who are in entertainment, uh, the professional classes, so people who are highly educated, more individualistic, um, and they are very much focused on their career minded and they're very ambitious. And then the lower middle classes you could have looked at as well. Of course, you can also look at um, working class subcultures, underclass, different types of subcultures as those. I put this out there because I think a lot of people will go straight with working class subcultures um, or subcultures that are reacting to mainstream society. But let's see sort of like how social class um, right throughout um, the social class hierarchy um, form subcultures. So my answer to the question was, one way in which an individual social class may shape subcultural formations is through socialization. The process of primary socialization shapes individuals through the family, and this leads to children adopting the norms and values of their family social class. So this is an idea that sort of like you are socialized into a social class, whether it's working class, middle class, upper class, you are socialized based on your, your family social class. This is often reinforced through secondary socialization, such as education, where an individual's tastes and attitudes are either approved of by the education system or rejected. So the education system reinforces um, your norms and values or it rejects them. And what you might do is then form a subculture of resistance against the education system. Archer argued that the rejection of working class habitus, particularly with respect to the way um, they were dressed in schools, leads to a form of symbolic violence against young working class pupils. This reinforces ideas that education does not accept them, and this leads to the formation of working class subcultures where status is awarded to individuals on the basis of conforming to the cultural tastes of the group. For example, wearing branded sportswear or developing a hyper heterosexual identity. This leads to the reproduction of working class subcultures from one generation to the next. What I've done here is I've taken an example that you may have come across in education. So it shows that lots of the learning that takes place in A-level sociology is synoptic. You can use this idea of identity formation and subcultures that is taken from education and apply it to a culture and identity question. A second way the subcultures are shaped by an individual social class is through re-socialization. Now this is a new kind of concept that if you haven't done culture and identity you may not be familiar with, but it's the idea of relearning the norms and values of society closely linked with things like social mobility or um, integrating into a new society. This is the process of learning alternative norms and values to those that have been already learned. While a family provides primary socialization, usually into the norms and values of their social class, 
Those who gain social mobility through education and gain higher status employment undergo the process of re-socialization. For example, working class students who have achieved an education may go on to study at university and qualify in one of the established professions such as law or medicine. As the norms and values of these professions are different to those of the working class and mainstream society, they will adopt new norms and values to fit in with their new role in society. For the professional classes, this may be through the language they use in the workplace, the events they attend, or the cultural knowledge they acquire through association with others within the professional subculture. The process of social mobility is reliant upon re-socialization from one social class habitus to another in order for the individual to succeed. Now, of course, I here have talked about professional subcultures. Professional subcultures, they do exist. They have different norms and values to mainstream society. They will be centered around the, uh, empl- the, the person's employment rather than their status in society. So I've used that as an example there um, rather than just go straight with working class. That covers that question. Let's look at our second question. Well, our second question focuses on what's called identity formation. I've put a few theories of identity formation up here. Um, there's functionist views of identity formation, the idea that we form our identity through the um, through conforming to the norms and values of the value consensus. And our Marxist views of identity formation are focused on social class. Feminist views of identity formation largely focused on gender and particularly gender socialization. Our interactionist views of identity formation, when you look at the likes of Cooley, who talks about the idea of the, um, the looking glass self, Goffman, who talks about different social roles, and Becker, who talks about labeling and how this has an impact on your identity. You can also move towards kind of late modern ideas with like Giddens, who talks about the idea of people constantly reinventing themselves, they become very reflexive. Um, you can also go into sort of like some of the postmodern ideas as well. So looking at the question, let's pull out our two hooks. Well, the two hooks here are structural factors. Now, structural factors, we know this to mean social class, gender, ethnicity. So the idea would be is that we might look to theories that suggest that social class is really important in our identity formation or gender is important in our uh, our identity formation. So therefore, we might be looking at Marxists and feminists. Um, And we've also put socially constructed. Now, socially constructed, wherever you see this in an exam, it should ring a kind of bell that sort of like says interactionism because interactionists see society as being socially constructed. They see most of the things that happen in society as being the product of social interactions. So when you see socially constructed, it should be a kind of little warning light to sort of like talk about interactionism. In my answer, I've gone with Marxism and I've gone with interactionism. So one explanation of identity formation is based on how individuals are influenced by structural factors, item A. Remember, 10 mark apply and analyze, always refer to the item, always do it explicitly. This is signposting to the examiner that you've used the item and that you're gonna develop something from the item in your response. Structural factors such as social class or gender can influence an individual's identity formation according to conflict theorists such as Marxists and feminists. I'm gonna use a bit of research to back this up. For example, Charlesworth argues that social class influences an individual's identity formation as the working class see themselves involved in a struggle between themselves and those with more financial capital and access to power. This develops into an us and them mentality which becomes part of an individual's identity. This idea of always being in conflict with those in power. Furthermore, another little bit of research here, Lawler argues a middle class identity is formed through claiming a sense of superiority over the working class cultures seeing it as derivative and distancing themselves from the activities of the working class. As a result, they develop an identity that is more in line with the upper classes to ensure that they do not find themselves labelled as lower class by others in the middle classes. A little bit of interactionism at the, bo- at the bottom, sort of like talking about how um, negative labelling. But what I've done is I've taken this idea of structural factors. I've seen how social class influences um, identity. I've looked at two groups. I've done the compare and contrast route for analysis. And I've got two bits of research in there. So that's a good response. My second response, a second explanation for the formation of identity is that identity is socially constructed. Interactionists argue that people make sense of their own self and define their own identity through social actions that they have with others. One of the earliest sociologists to suggest this was Cooley, who argued that individuals gain a sense of their identity through their perceptions of how others see them. 
As a result, their identity is formed through the actions and reactions of people around them display when the person behaves in a particular manner. Furthermore, Goffman argued that people construct their identities based upon social contexts, taking on different roles in different social situations. For example, individuals may play one role at home, such as a father or a partner, whereas in the workplace, they may take on a different role, such as a manager or an employee. This demonstrates how social contexts help form individual identities. There's my link back at the bottom, two bits of research in there. Again, and I've developed the point that identity is socially constructed. Okay, so that finishes day 13. On to day 14, the penultimate day on culture and identity. Let's look at the question. Outline and explain two ways that age is stigmatized in mass culture. A couple of things you can look at there, stigmatizing particularly young people, I mean very young people, teenage years, and the way in which they are stigmatized in society. And we can talk about how age is stigmatized negatively in um, old age as well. Question two, apply material from item A, analyze two ways in which sexual identity is formed in contemporary society. Now, sexual identity, this can be heterosexual identity, it can be sexuality, and it can also be um, LGBTQ community and sort of like how they develop their sexuality. So a number of different things you can talk about there. In the item, there's some hints. Sociologists have suggested there have been changes in the way in which people's sexuality is, repre is represented in society over the last 50 years. While society has become more open about sexuality, there has been an increase in the sexualization of individuals' physical appearances. So this can, this is hinting kind of, uh, societies become more open about sexuality. So we can talk about um, things like LGBTQ and sort of like how that has become more accepted in society increasing the sexualization of individuals' physical appearances, then we could be hinting sort of like towards um, changes in the way um, males represented and um, the increased amount of sexualization of females in society as well. That finishes uh, day 13 and there's your question for day 14. Hopefully you'll join me tomorrow um, to look at my answers to day 14. Thanks for watching.